Get the latest Impact Podcast right into your inbox each week. Subscribe by entering your email address at impactpodcast.com to make sure you never miss an interview. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by ERI. ERI has a mission to protect people, the planet, and your privacy and is the largest fully integrated IT and electronics asset disposition provider and cybersecurity focused hardware destruction company in the United States and maybe even the world. For more information on how ERI can help your business properly dispose of outdated electronic hardware devices, please visit eridirect.com. This episode of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by Closed Loop Partners. Closed Loop Partners is a leading circular economy investor in the United States with an extensive network of Fortune 500 corporate investors, family offices, institutional investors, industry experts, and impact partners. Closed Loop's platform spans the arc of capital from venture capital to private equity, bridging gaps, and fostering synergies to scale the circular economy. To find Closed Loop Partners, please go to www.closedlooppartners.com. Welcome to another edition of the Impact Podcast. I'm John Shigarian, and I'm so excited and honored to have with us today, Shonda Pador. Shonda is the Vice President of Procurement for Americas for Alstom. Welcome, Shonda, to the Impact Podcast. Hi, John. Really excited to be with you today. Hey, listen, it's great to have you. And before we get talking about all the important and impactful work you and your uh, colleagues are doing at Alstom, can you share a little bit about the Shonda Kador story, where you grew up, how you even got on this journey. No, ab- absolutely. So I was actually, um, I'll start off with, um, I would say taking it a little a little back and okay. being, um, and for me, that means, so I was actually born in an island. I was born on the island of Grenada. Um, my family migrated here when I was seven years old. I migrated to New York City. Um, okay. I spent my entire childhood and, um, Obviously, my uh, my uh, teenage years in uh, growing up in New York City. Um, yeah, so I graduated from uh, Binghamton University with a with a bachelor's in computer science. Started working at Sikorsky Aircraft. Sikorsky Aircraft um, is the designer and manufacturer of the Black Hawk helicopter. Uh, so I would say, in terms of growing up, I started out on that journey. So I spent 21 years in aerospace. And uh, I would say the last year, a little over a year now on the real side of the business. But the cool thing I would say in terms of, you all know the cliche, planes, trains, and automobiles. Yeah. I feel for, you know, for me, it's, you know, planes, trains, and helicopters. Or maybe the, the, the reverse is helicopters, planes, and trains, and I'll tell you the connectivity there. So okay. when I started out, um, I actually was this, uh, systems engineer on the Black Hawk helicopter. So everything in the cockpit, my team had responsibility for all the navigation, communications. And I'll tell you that it was a sense of pride. And even to this day, I I, I would be remiss if I left that out, right? Because oftentimes, um, and I remember this, you know, when I was early in my career, I would often be asked, so what do you do? You know, and then I would always say, you know, I'm, a, I'm an engineer on the Black Hawk helicopter. And I would always get that wow factor. You know, the eyes would light up. And then it got to the point where I started seeing it with that sense of pride. I'm an engineer on the Black Hawk helicopter. Right. So it really became something that, you know, obviously I was proud of, proud of the product that I worked on then. Um, about five years uh, after being at Sikorsky, I stayed within the United Technologies family. And uh, and I was also after my second master's degree. Then I went to our corporate office and I got my first exposure into operations. Started working um, at our different sites at the time in uh, supply chain, manufacturing and quality. Um, so that was really, I would say, the start for me in terms of getting exposed to the operation side of the business, getting actually an opportunity to see aerospace and commercial, because I also worked at uh, carrier air conditioner, which was part of um, uh, United Technologies at the time. Then I transitioned to Pratt & Whitney. 
And I spent 13 years at Pride & Whitney and Pride & Whitney is the designer and manufacturer. We des they design and manufacture um, jet engines, commercial and military jet engines. So you can see the helicopters to the jet engines um, mm. uh, connection there. So I, I, that was my journey, spent 13 years um, you know, working on the commercial military jet engines. And from that standpoint, if you think of, you know, the Airbus 320 or the Airbus 220, many, many people know the product and don't realize, um, uh, you know, the the actual, I would say, they, they probably hear a lot about maybe GE, but not yeah. so much of Pride & Whitney. Um, and then that also exposed me to Airbus. So I had the opportunity to work really closely with Airbus from a supplier development standpoint. So when I say a breadth of like really core operations and again, supply chain experience, um, couldn't, you know, really couldn't beat it. It really kind of sharpened, you know, my diverse experience from the technical and leveraging that from to drive that operational excellence. So then um, in the last year, I transitioned and I left the RTL, UTC is, is now RTX. I left the RTX family and I joined Alstom. And, uh, and it's just been an incredible journey since then. And, you know, if you see the background behind me, yeah. you know, it's from joining this organization, it's, it's, it's personal. So I'm the vice president of, and you said it earlier, I'm the vice president of procurement. Um, and on our side, you know, it's inclusive of, uh, I would say I, I cover the entire region. So I cover, you know, everything um, in terms of location from uh, North America, Central America and South America for all of our um, key businesses in the procurement side, rolling stock and components, services, um, our digital and integrated systems, as well as indirect. So, you know, exciting times, you know, for us right now. But the, the big piece for me is being able to say, you know, I've truly, and over the last, you know, 22 years, I've truly gotten the opportunity to be part of um, organizations that connect communities, organizations that connect people, and organizations that truly, um, you know, if from a transportation standpoint, are innovators and leaders in that space. And that's why I say, you know, for me, planes, trains, and helicopters. I love it. And, you know, one thing I want to do, Shonda, and that's, I love your background. It's fascinating. Um, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, you you grew up, you moved to New York City. You, we shared a little bit off the air. I grew up in Queens. You grew up in Brooklyn. And you and I are both very used, you know, part of our lives, just normal life is growing up with a wonderful train and subway system in New York. Talk a little bit of, for our listeners and viewers around the world who don't know what Alstom is. And by the way, to find Shonda and all of her co colleagues at Alstom, you could go to www.alstom, A-L-S-T-O-M.com. What is Alstom and what do you produce and, and why is that so exciting? So many people don't know um, Alstom as a name, but Alstom is, and I would say we are the leader in what we call greener and smarter mobility worldwide. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that, but maybe what I'll do to help connect the dots for people a bit is highlighting um, the products that, that they know and that we design, manufacture, and also that we service, okay. um, service and maintain. So for instance, if have you ever been to the Atlanta airport? Yeah, 100%. And yes. If you've been to the Atlanta airport and if you've taken the plane train, you've yes. been on an awesome product. So that plane train that takes you between um, the terminals, you, most people call it a monorail, we call it an automated people mover. That's one of the products that, um, uh, that we manufacture. That's one of the products that we also maintain. If you've ever, you know, if you, like I said, if you've been to New York City and taken the subway, mm -hmm. um, you know, 4,100, you know, that's a big number, but if you, you know, we all know how um, uh, diverse the subway lines or the subway system in New York City is, it's the largest transit system in North America. And, you know, we design not all of them, but we also design, manufacture, and also maintain the subway, the subway cars as well. So all sum overall is, you know, our portfolio ranges from what we call high-speed trains, metros, monorails, trams, we do customized services, uh, infrastructure signaling, and also um, digital mobility so uh, solutions for our customers. 
So you may not know, it's not a household name, but people know the product. If you know of Amtrak, Amtrak sure. Casella, the yes. new Amtrak Casella yeah. is also, um, that's also designed and also being manufactured um, uh, by us as well. And the really key thing to that, it's all made in the United States. Wow. Right? Amtrak Acela, 95% of that train is by America, which yeah. means the component I love it. right here, right, right here local, right actually. So even something a little bit, um, bring it closer to home. Yes. Amtrak Acela right here in New York State, upstate New York in Hornell, New York. Really? I never even yes. knew that. Oh, we love this. My yeah. wife and I love the Acela. My son too, he's been on it, loves it. Um, and you were sharing a little bit when we were off the air earlier, how personal it is to you. Not only is your background beautiful, and I was commenting on how nice and beautiful your background is and how um, uh, indicative of your great brand that it is, but you said when you get on the train every morning, explain what you said to me about how personal this opportunity at Alstom is for you, because when you get on the train every morning, explain what you see. Yeah, I think many times when, when we go to work, um, you know, it's the element of, you know, I go to, I come to work and I, to get to work, I actually travel on, you know, one of the trains that we actually manufacture. So when I get on and um, even with my, with my daughter, when we get on, the first thing I often look for is a nameplate. I always look for the nameplate to see, is this one of ours? You know, so I always look at the, Oftentimes, depending on the direction that the car is going in, that top left-hand corner to see if it's, uh, but, and it's a sense of pride, right? Because oh, yeah. there's an element around, you know, I'm part of that. So everything that you, you really see on a train, my team, from a procurement standpoint, standpoint we buy, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, that element is, is, is a sense of pride, especially when you come to work and we understand the commitment to the quality, the commitment to the delivery, because it's not only that we're putting it out there in communities, I'm also part of that community. I'm also part of, um, you know, you know, we say we're connecting cities, but we're part of it. So it's, you, you come in and it's that commitment to making sure like anything else that we do a good job because we're also part of that community. That's, I love that. And, and, and you know, um, before we get into, I want to get into exactly what you do in terms of sustainable procurement and its benefit and challenges. But before we get into that, um, Chandra, I, you mentioned at the top of the show, you mentioned it very casually. So I just thought when you said you're the, you're the vice president of procurement for Americas, I'm thinking you're going to say, okay, you know, United States, maybe even just the Northeast. You said, actually, it's the United States. And how, 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 how far does your vice presidency go? Well, uh, the span in terms of, so how, um, and maybe I could tell you this in regards to, you know, Alstom to kind of put it into scope. Sure. So when I talk about Alstom leading the way to greener and smarter mobility worldwide, yeah. we are, we have 80,000 employees globally. Wow. Um, that's 175 different nationalities across 250 sites, um, and that's within 63 countries. And we're split by region. Uh, in the Americas, uh, we have about, let's say, roughly about 14,000 uh, employees within um, within this region. And the Americas region for Alstom is the what we would say the largest uh, geographical uh, region within Alstom. And the reason being, it's that with our 14,000 employees, we have a presence in uh, 12 countries, North, Central, South America. Um, and we're actually the number one private rail operator in North America, operating across 16 airports, 20 transit systems, um, and that's Canada, the United States, and Latin America. So, so when, when you know, so when we hear about the in, in, uh, Inflation Reduction Act and the whole uh, shift from the linear to circular economy, and that fact that we're decarbonizing the world right now, we're all trying to get to either net zero or some sort of version, get on that journey towards net zero. I mean, you're literally at the crossroads of Main Street and Main Street because trains are just one of the greatest ways to decarbonize any culture or any society, right? Absolutely. And one of the things, and it's 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 actually coincidental that 
you know, you and I are having this conversation about sustainability and sustainable procurement this week. Mm. Um, this week in particular at Awesome Globally is um, Corporate Social Responsibility Week. And this is, a, this is us putting a spotlight on what we as a company do um, from a CSR standpoint, as well as, you know, I would say even um, highlighting and spotlighting for our employees how they could be part of the movement as well. You know, we know that businesses globally um, are accountable for, um, you know, sustainable solutions and our impact to the communities and the impact to the environment. And, you know, Alstom is leading the forefront in regards to that. So, you know, I'll give you a couple of examples because our corporate social responsibility, um, uh, I would say strategy, is anchored on four key pillars. Um, and these key pillars are enabling what we call uh, decarbonization of mobility. So that is, you know, our, our facilities. And you remember I was telling you we have, we're in 63 countries, over 250 um, 250 sites, you know, are we, we, our goal is to power 100% all of our sites with renewable energy. Um, for our new solutions, our goal there is to um, ensure that all of our new solutions are eco-designed. Um, and then the other piece is how do we ensure that we're making our trains more efficient, right? The other pillar is caring for our people. We can't do what we do without our people, making sure that safety is a non-negotiable, safety stays as our ultimate priority, and that is absolutely at the forefront of what we do, and ensuring that we're also implementing a culture of um, diversity and inclusion. You know, how do we drive more women into, like, management, engineering, and professional roles, um, you know, by, by, you know, within our, within, um, our businesses? The third pillar that we're anchored on from a sustainable, um, I would say a corporate responsibility, a sustainability standpoint is our impact on our society. You know, why we're actually doing this, you know, the socioeconomical uh, impact uh, driven by, you know, what we call a community actions, because we want to make sure that we have a presence um, and we have a strong presence in the communities where our employees live and work. And last but not least uh, is the element of a responsible partner. I mean, responsible partner for us is, you know, 60, almost 60% of our high-speed trains flows down to our suppliers, right? Um, so from that aspect, we need to also ensure that our suppliers are also compliant. They have a CSR uh, strategy or program they have an ethics and compliance uh, program within their facilities as well. And from a sustainable procurement standpoint, it, those, those elements are important. And for us is safe working conditions. Um, are you environmentally friendly? Are you socially responsible? Do you have diversity and inclusion? And for me, from a procurement standpoint, those elements, as we are assessing who we're going to partner with, who we're going to collaborate with, those elements are important. Those elements are assessed. Those elements are, um, uh, I would say we have charters where we continuously monitor and also drive those engagements because we do our part. We need to make sure who we partner collaborate with. They're also doing their part as well. And you know what? If they don't have the resources to implement these um, strategies and programs, we train. So we also have uh, targets around training and investing with our suppliers to make sure that we help them along the lines of the journey. Because if we're going to hold you accountable, we also want to make sure that we are fair and that we're also balanced in regards to that as well. Shonda, does your do you produce as a all, all some produce an annual CSR report with all this information in it? We do. Oh, we, we do in terms of, and when you're saying in terms of um, our targets and our goals. Yeah. Yes. And it's on your, and I assume that report every year is published in April or May, and then it lives on your website then, therefore from there on in. Yes. That's, that's great. And by the way, for our, yeah. for our listeners and viewers who've just joined us, we've got Shonda Cordor with us. She's the vice president of procurement for the Americas. To find 
And all the great work that she that Chandra's doing with her colleagues at Alstom, please go to www.alstom.com. Of course, you could also find their CSR report and all the other great information about Alstom and the important work and the impact they're making in all the communities they work in around the world. I'm on their website now. It's full of great information. And what I love beyond your in your background, beyond the train, I mean, you, you put your money where your mouth is, Shonda. Top employer in North America 2023, top employer global 2023. That says a lot about, you know, when you have 80,000 employees, that says a lot about Alstom and all the great and impactful work you're doing. No, absolutely. And when I when you when um we talked about our social responsibility strategy anchored on caring for people, you know, those are the I mean, I think the, the awards that you see there global as well as we we get we have it by country. I only highlighted North America because obviously we're in uh that's the region that we're in, but it's anchored on we care about our people, we care about the um, like the HR practices that we have, the employee practices that we have. And this is, we've been winning now from the last, uh, I would say few years, um, the top employer award for exactly that, our commitment to bettering, um, I would say the, uh, the organization and the employee practices, I would say more or less having outstanding HR uh, practices and having HR, um, I said practices, I meant policies, having right. outstanding HR policies and employee practices yeah. that remain at our core. And that's part of, you know, like it, without our people, we can't do what we do. So we remain committed to driving and accelerating and making sure that we commit to our people. So Shonda, as a vice president of procurement for the Americas, talk a little bit about sustainability and procurement and the benefits that that means for not only Alstom, but the community at large and, and, uh, and the communities that you serve at large, and then some of the challenges as well. What you, know, what you face as this, in this very important role uh, as vice president of procurement in the Americas. Yeah, I, you know, the, the the challenge that we, so let me start it with, um, and I'll go back in terms of, because I highlighted sure. our overall kind of corporate strategy, sure. um, uh, you know, in terms of the, the, the CSR, but, you know, it doesn't, de it does not deviate much from the sustainable, I would say, you know, that's a global vision, but when it comes to sustainable procurement, all we do is we reinforce those commitments with our suppliers, right? So when I talk about the four kind of pillars, you you know, you have acting as a responsible business partner. You know, for us is do we make sure that we screen all of our suppliers for ethics and compliance? That part is critical to, to do business with us. That's the key to uh, that's the key to entry. And we ask you to sign our charter committing that you know when it comes to human rights, when it comes to the environment, that you're doing the right things. Um, in those in that space, um, then the element around uh, creating um, a positive impact on society, you know, for us is you know a commitment to um, over you know having over 500 suppliers trained by 2025. That is the element of how do we ensure that within the communities that we we live and work that we're also investing. In our custom, in um, in our suppliers, in their development to be able to respond to our customers' requests in regards to uh, those elements, and making sure that we can master and have that agility with our suppliers that are doing business with us and sharing that expertise. So that's really core. The other piece in terms of you know us um, uh, reinforcing that commitment is the element around caring for the people, right? Hundred percent of our suppliers. We make sure that we monitor their performance, you know, doing our due, due diligence in terms of, um, you know, management, health and safety as a priority. You know, we do local audits to also make sure we are driving that because we want to make sure that, you know, we hold them accountable. And then the other piece is the decarbonization. You know, when you look at we have targets of around 30 uh, percent. Um, um, uh, re uh, emission reduction by 2030, 2030. For us, that means, you know, when we are looking at everything in terms of our raw material suppliers, how we're, we're making those selections and, you know, identifying and collaborating with our innovative and engineering partners to, you know, identify um, materials 
that are that would actually support an alternate materials that would be able to support um, those initiatives. So at Alston, if I'm understanding this right, which I'm really loving, you create these very high standards for Alstom, this very huge multinational corporation. Those high standards then, you then create in your in your role as vice president of procurement, a domino effect of greatness because right. you're demanding the same type of rigorous uh, adherence to the most modern and best practices of safety and of sustainable practices and of human rights and diversity to your suppliers as well. That That is correct. You know, our customers hold us to a certain standard that we have to, um, you know, we have to honor and maintain. And in order for us to ensure that we are meeting those standards, we also need to ensure that our suppliers, because when you look at our make versus buy, um, you know, we're over 70%, you know, buy versus make. So we have a critical dependence on our supply chain. We have a critical dependence on, you know, ensuring that they are, um, they're reliable, their their quality is in line with what we need. They're delivering at the pace and the rate that our customers need. All of those elements are, are connected and we can, and we don't, uh, we don't segregate them in any particular way because it's part of our overall management, which is why the selection process up front is core. So there's, there's no surprises when we, when we try to, uh, enforce when we try to drive the accountability because we make sure that we are transparent um, around what the expectations are with our suppliers from the start of our engagement. So is that what, when you talk about a fairer, safer, greener supply chain, is that what you're referring to then? That how the rigorousness of how you manage that supply chain and the and the standards that you hold your suppliers to? That's correct. We make sure it's mandatory for all and it's a must. It, you know, I um, it's you know, I jokingly say if you think of um, uh, like 007, it's the license to operate, right? You know, in order to <laughs> do business, you, you know, this is this is the license to do business with us, and that's that's, that's part great, of the though. Core. That's great. Yeah. You lay it out, and you and you and and then you enforce it. That's you might know, yeah. but but your clarity of how you lay it out. It makes sense because you're not just talking and talk. You walk the walk yourself at Alstom, and then you're asking your suppliers to walk the similar walk. Yeah, that is correct. That's great. Talk a little that bit about modern correct. times that we live in now. You know, um, you transition from the avionics industry. And I want to go back to that in a little while as well. But you know, you moved over to the to the to the rails to side rail. of the industry trades. Talk, but you did it during a fascinating time. You know, we're now living in what is a but what we all as professionals call the, the post-COVID uh, era. Talk a bit, little bit yeah. about how, how has COVID impacted your industry and your suppliers, and what does that mean to Alstom? Yeah, I mean, so it's, it's a great point. Um, there's definitely been um, ups and downs in terms of market trends over the last three years. Um, uh, you know, when I was on the aerospace side, I, you know, I think it's, it's, uh, you know, it was pretty evident what the impact of the, um, of the pandemic had, and, you know, obviously with a reduction in, in air travel. So yeah. that, that was pretty clear coming and making the transition over to, um, you know, I think I came at a time when the market was, um, I would say slowly kind of, you know, transitioning back to a recovery period. And um, in that space, you know, for me, it's the the uh, a lot of our suppliers, especially our member, I would say, if you look at the core of our business today, many of our suppliers, especially if they are localized in the United States, they really struggled with the the supply chain disruptions. They really struggled, you know, heavily with the uh, inflation. Um, you know, we saw higher costs in transportation. We see higher costs in certain commodities. All of those really put a strain. And then the other challenge that um, they all experienced, and we, you know, had uh, we we felt a little bit of this pinch as well, is also on the, the labor side, the human labor side. Right. And you know, having right. the uh, um, the now say the 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 readily accessible, you know, and really trained. Uh, labor, because what we do in some aspects is is you know, highly complex, highly engineered. So you, oftentimes there's a unique skill set um, that we try to attract, and you know we felt it on our suppliers 
And many of them, you know, may not necessarily be large in the scale that we are. And they really struggle with being able to absorb and reliably, reliably recover quickly um, to those really uh, changing, uh, changing times. And you know, we're, we 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 feel a, a slight recovery now, but it is going to take um, it's going to take some time for us to truly kind of get back where the inflation levels. You know, I think that is starting to be to come down a bit, but they definitely um, and we felt it, but our suppliers for sure. Uh, felt it and be making sure that we can then support the demand because we had a slow, we had a down peak and then the up peak. And when the up peak came, making sure that we were ready to be able to respond in that time frame. And it was a it was a bumpy transition. Are are trains now in a world that is is trying to decarbonize as fast as we can to protect this beautiful mm. world and environment that we live in? Our trains, is this a great time to be in the train industry and the train manufacturing it is. industry? Yeah. I would say it, it's a it's a good time depending on the region. Uh, and okay. the reason I say the reason yeah. that I say the reason that I say that is, you know, it's a good time if you think really broadly about where, where we're about to go and what we need in terms of you know decarbonizing and um and, and truly trying to find, you know, to drive into sustainable solutions. You know, when you look within the region that we're in, um, we are we are a few years behind that readiness. Um, and you know, in, in terms of making sure we have the right infrastructure to truly take advantage of the trees. So there are some cities that we know are more equipped than others. And you know, if we had the right infrastructure and if we could accelerate the implementation of making sure the infrastructure is there, we would be able to leverage and take advantage of, you know, el the electrification, the high speed trains, you know, right now, you know, we're, we're the convers the good thing is the conversations are being held, but right. it's now our ability to be able to truly ramp up and move with lightning speed for implementation. And that to me is really the core that would set us up for success. Got it. You know, you you've been there about a year or so, Shonda. What what accomplishments have are you the most proud of right now that you and your team have been able to achieve uh, in 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 the at, at your time at uh, Alstom? No, that's a that's a really good question. Um, you know, for us this year, it's there's been a number of transitions, and um, you know, like anything else, it's being able to stabilize because one of the things that happened within our business is you know uh two years ago Alstom acquired bombardier transportation and you know many people are familiar with the bombardier brand so we uh, we acquired the bombardier rail um business so the last two years our team and my team in, as well has been truly trying to integrate two businesses and within that, that integration there are a number of things. You got process conversion, you got training, you know, when we say process conversion is the elements of how do you ultimately take the best of, you know, you got two really um, innovative and strong leaders in this space in rail. And how do you leverage the best practices from both of those companies to ensure that now we are, we converge to you know to that one process that is the best of the best right um so you know my team has been you know really trying to accelerate that integration that conversions and then the other element is how do we drive this this, this the stability you know because the teams has been you know they're different systems different tools um and you know the new people right trying to now work together in that uniform way and for us is really trying to create and connect um, in that manner, so we can truly then ensure, because even with our suppliers as well, the suppliers is, you know, somewhere, um, you know, from the, you know, whether it's from Party, Alstom, also converging to them and making sure that now we're all aligned with that unified approach. So now we can move with agility, we can move with speed, we can move and drive the flow that our production and our um, our production system, uh, excuse me, centers need to deliver to our uh, customers' commitment. Shonda, how was your aerospace uh, background 
which is vast and fascinating and fun when you talked about the Blackhawk, because of course, even I know about the Blackhawk and it's one of the uh, shining stars of, a, of, the, of, of America. Um, how has that been able to inform you to be even more effective in this really cool and important uh, role that you have at Alstom? No, uh, I, you know, I, I, um, when I, when I, the last few, I would say the last few months talking to different teams and, uh, that, that's a really excellent question. Mm. Um, and because oftentimes, you know, when you, especially when you cross industries yeah. on the aerospace side, coming over into rail, you know, for me having that, um, that technical foundation working in engineering and incorporating computer science, um, also having the operation excellence and being able to execute, you know, operational, what we do, oftentimes there's a sourcing, there's negotiations, um, but there's also a, an operation, very process oriented um, mindset, right? So everything you do and, you know, we drive that element of continuous improvement. We drive the, even within our business processes, that is core to our success. And, you know, go even going back to the, the previous question that you asked, that's the foundation and that's the the the, the mindset that we're also um, trying to drive is making sure that we are um, identifying root causes, we're putting corrective actions in place and moving quickly. So when you think about merging and for me trying to now merge my, my experience, um, on from aerospace, my experience from engineering and operations into what we do, and then you know spending uh, the length of time in uh, in uh, in supply chain at, at um, you know on the aerospace side. For me, it's universal. There are certain core elements, and I I, I tell the, the teams all the time. There are certain parts around the product that you know you would ultimately have to to learn and and and, and then get a little bit more familiar with because a full Full train, you know, in terms of that end-to-end -end full, you know, um, uh, uh, product is different. Where you know, it's just a a, a jet engine, right? right? The helicopters also had the full product, right? But on the jet engine, it's just it's just you know one right. kind of component that makes up that's part of that full aircraft. Here, right. I would say it's more similar to on the Blackhawk side to your point because you got a full. Um, yeah, you got a full aircraft and a full product, and here we got a full train. But mm -hmm. in terms of what we do, in terms of the fundamentals associated with um, uh, with procurement and supply chain, it's universal. If you if you're very process driven, you know there's there there are elements between both sides of the industries that is transversal, and that to me is where you can then kind of come in, be planted in what I do. And then come in, learn the business, and then uh, kind of leapfrog forward because there are synergies, there are elements around, and I think it's probably from a functional standpoint where, irrespective of the uh, uh, the industry, there are some definitely connections that we can that I that I've been able to leverage. That's awesome. Um, you know, Chandra, you've seen a lot in your career um, and worked on a lot of very very cool. Uh, brands and projects, and now you're working on another cool one at, the, at a great time as we're decarbonizing uh, our society and our world. What's next for Alstom that you're excited about? What gets you and your colleagues out of bed in the morning and projects and initiatives that you're allowed to talk about on the air with us today at Impact? Yeah, I would say the the, the one thing that on that one thing, but there are a number of things yeah. that kind of that that keeps that I would say keep me up, but keeps me energized. Yeah, and that is you know growth in the market. When you look at um, you know, I talked a little bit about the Amtrak seller, and right now you know the upgrade because within the United States, um, you know, with the infrastructure bill and the funding that was that has you know the Biden administration had flowed down, you know, that has truly, you know, allowed for, you know, I would say putting some focus around transitioning and upgrading, you know, rail and the rail industry within the within uh, the United States, right? So for us, you know, there are, um, you know, transit customers that are now really exploring, you know, is this an opportunity for us to either upgrade the existing fleet add a new fleet, add some new cars. There's new technology that's that's available. When I talked about, you know, any new solutions for us is going is our, our, our will be 100% eco 
um, uh, designed. So there, are, there's definitely technology, there's innovation that um, many of the transit uh, customers and airports want to take over. They have an aging fleet and this is the time. And we just need to make sure from a procurement and supply chain standpoint that we are ready. And that readiness comes in, you know, there is um, components that we make, there are components that we buy. And making sure, once again, linking it right back to our suppliers, making sure they're ready, making sure that we've developed and we've invested in their development so they can stand with us and deliver quality, um, quality parts on time and at cost, right? So when you think about, and when I think about what's ahead, it's our readiness to be able to ensure that we can support our customers commit, uh, excuse me, our customers, um, uh, well, I'll say our commitment to our customer when that time comes, because that time is coming. You know, Sh Shonda, you know, you have had a very, very successful career as careers go, and it's only, you know, even going further, uh, you're still very young, uh, relatively speaking. Share a little bit about, you know, we have a lot of listeners and viewers around the world um, who are graduating high school, who are graduating college, and maybe even grad school. And they and they see you breaking through, uh, and 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 uh, and and in this very very uh, what was uh, looks like an old uh, guy school uh, industrialized corporation, and you've broken through all the barriers. What would you? What's some advice you'd give to your 18 year old self? What's some advice you'd give to your 22 year old self for our young listeners out there who want to be the next Shonda Kador, who want to be, uh, you know, uh, a VP of procurement or VP of sustainability or supply chain, and really not only make a nice living for themselves, but also make a difference in this world, like you are. No, and um, I always so one of the things that, I mean um, is a passion of mine is giving back. Um, I stand on a quote that says, lift as you climb. And for me, that is you know, really powerful because let's say we didn't, we, you know, for many of us, we didn't get here by chance. And, um, you know, lifting as I climb is making sure I give back. And I also coach and develop and help others to get to where I am. Because, you know, many times if I had the, um, you know, if I knew then what I know now, yeah. You know, probably I wouldn't say I probably would have been on a different path, but at least it would there are certain decisions that I would have considered differently, right? Um, and not you know, bad, good or bad. It's the element around get comfortable with being the only one. Whether you are a you know a woman in the space, whether you are a black woman in the space, you know there are times where um, you know you are the only one. You are the only one at the table. You are the one that have to speak up. And just being able to um, get uncomfortable and okay with that by making sure that you also um, help and pave a way for others to join you at the table. I always say there's room because many times there's a small um, number of us. There's definitely room for others. And, you know, it's on us to make sure it's on. And it's one of my, my, my commitments. One of the things I'm passionate about is making sure that I take the time to also coach and develop and help others and given whether it's real time feedback, um, but then really just kind of sharing my journey, sharing my story, sharing how I got here and then helping them and being and making sure I'm accessible um, to them whenever they but that element of being comfortable and being the only one is important. Um, but it's the same way of just saying, you know, don't be afraid to just take chances. You know, don't be afraid to um, kind of trek through the unknown. Don't be afraid to uh, chase or go after the messy assignments because oftentimes the messy assignments are the ones that give you that exposure. They give you the visibility. They give you the learning. Don't get comfortable. Um, you know, it's the element of continue to continuous, con con continually uh, challenge and stretch yourself, right? Mm -hmm. That's how we grow. That's how we learn. And you'll make mistakes. I always say, you know what, if we were all supposed to be perfect, then, you know, I don't think this, this world would definitely be a different place. You're supposed to make mistakes. And when you do, shake it off, dust your shoulders off and keep on moving. That's the resilience. Love it. And that's 
the resilience that ultimately drive results. I love it. And that's such wonderful and heart spoken advice and true advice. I'm 61 and everything you just said rings true in my life, in, in my friend's life that have broken through. And, you know, I had, a, I had an old friend in, in, the, in the horse racing industry and he, about making mistakes, he always said, hey, Johnny, don't worry about it. If you're breaking plates, that means you're in the kitchen and you want to be in the kitchen, man. So so he says, that's good news. So don't worry about making mistakes. That's all part of the process. And, and, uh, and you know, let yourself off the hook on that stuff, because that means you're really trying hard. And I love it. And you're and you're well, what a great mindset in terms of coaching. You've inspired me. You've impressed me today. I'm sure all of our listeners around the world have been similarly impressed and inspired by you. Shonda, thank you so much for spending time with us. And as we know, sustainability and impact and all the important work you're doing with your colleagues at Alstom isn't, there's no finish line. It's a journey. So you're always welcome back on the Impact Podcast to continue to share Alstom's journey, your journey, and, and all the success that you're making. For our listeners and viewers who want to find Shonda and her colleagues and all the important work they're doing in sustainability and impact in CSR, please go to www.alstom, A-L-S-T-O-M.com. When you get on your train somewhere, look up in the corner, see if it's an Alstom train. You'll feel proud that you listen to this podcast. You'll be feel proud that a lot of those trains are made right in New York, in upstate New York. Shonda Kador, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for inspiring all of us. And thank you mostly for making the world a better place. Thank you for having me. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by Engage. Engage is a digital booking platform revolutionizing the talent booking industry. With thousands of athletes, celebrities, entrepreneurs, and business leaders, Engage is the go-to spot for booking talent, for speeches, custom experiences, live streams, and much more. For more information on Engage or to book talent today, visit letsengage.com. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by ERI. ERI has a mission to protect people, the planet, and your privacy and is the largest fully integrated IT and electronics asset disposition provider and cybersecurity focused hardware destruction company in the United States and maybe even the world. For more information on how ERI can help your business properly dispose of outdated electronic hardware devices, please visit eridirect.com.